want to get started now with the next section, which is um, conversation with the masters. So this, is, uh, this has transformed a little bit. Can everyone see the, uh, can everyone see the pictures of the masters? Dan, do you see ever, all of the masters? It was, it was all, these, <laughs> we have, uh, <laughs> we have pictures of all of the masters. Everyone see all the masters. You've seen that. I've shown repetitive slides. Oh, wait a minute. It looks like maybe I have a little problem with my PowerPoint slide. Let's see here. There we go. Okay, there, there it is. There it is. Oh, I made a mistake. And we do have Brian Haugen also who has our, he is no longer an endocrinologist. He's an endocrinologist who is uh, with a Zen-like um, uh, uh, psychology, so he is a Zendocrinologist. <laughs> Dr. Brian Halligan, our representative. We're very multidisciplinary, so we have a Zendocrinologist among them. So what we wanted to do uh, today is really um, review thyroid cancer in a, from a 30,000-foot view. And so we wanted to do that through the lens of the World Congress. And so we asked our uh, steering committee uh, to, um, to review things. And, and this is uh, in the context of uh, this, uh, this quote, which is really the kind of underlying mission statement for our World Congress, may there never develop in me the notion that my education is complete, but give me the strength and leisure and zest continually to enlarge my knowledge. So you see all of the masters uh, all of the lecturers that we have today, not accepting the existing information, but moving forward and learning that lesions we thought were malignant, as you heard this morning, may not be, though they may not also be what we typically think of as benign. And the cytologic classification, which is our grounding, uh, the Bethesda system, is undergoing new modifications. So change is part of our thyroid cancer landscape. So. You see the, the program, we, we tried to really, um, this lens of looking at thyroid cancer through the World Congress program and through the World Congress Steering Committee is, is with an understanding that we have really tried hard to go from alpha to omega, all aspects of thyroid cancer with the program. You, you understand the depth of the program. The keynote presentations, one component of that program include Dr. Fagan, The Genetic Landscape of Thyroid Cancer 2017, Dr. Freeman, Surgery of Primary Thyroid Cancer and Its Recurrence, Dr. Haugen, Surveillance and Management of Persistent and Recurrent Thyroid Cancer, Dr. Kopp, that wonderful lecture on the legacy of Theodore Cocker, uh, the adjuvant therapy for differentiated cancer by Martin Schlumberger, and systemic therapy for metastatic disease, Lori Worth. So you see the range of topics, you see the multidisciplinary nature of thyroid cancer. <coughs> we also had panel sessions looking at the pre-op evaluation of thyroid nodules, integrating imaging, cytology and molecular marker, the management of low-risk carcinoma, which is an expanded area in our work in thyroid cancer, the assessment of nodal metastasis, the assessment, detection, and management of nodal metastasis, medullary carcinoma, radioactive iodine, and redifferentiation therapy for thyroid cancer, invasive disease treatment, evaluation of poorly differentiated anaplastic and aggressive variants of thyroid cancer, and systemic therapy for metastatic disease. These are the topics of our panels. We also had 18 different Meet the Professor topics, 21 different instructional course topics, three hot topics, the last of which you just saw, three different video sessions. 124 oral paper presentations and 16 sessions on e-posters covering the gamut alpha omega to on thyroid cancer. And so what what I wanted to do was to look at thyroid cancer through the lens of the steering committee and so I asked each of the steering committee members to present the top 3 or 4 approximately <coughs> bulleted points looking at their experience through the World Congress kind of looking at game changers, new ideas, notable faculty, both existing renowned faculty and new faculty, uh, challenges that have been identified, and also, frankly, 
to look at how the World Congress, what educationally was a tool that was useful and what educationally was maybe a tool that we used because we used it last year and maybe isn't the best tool in the future. And so we tried to give the steering committee overlapping assignments. So, you know, different members of the steering committee looked at different segments of the Congress to try and really assess it comprehensively. And so I want to just start with presenting uh, Dr. Shaha, who needed for a uh, other uh, institutional issue, needed to be absent today. But he <coughs> reviewed the Indian Subcontinent Symposium as his section of the program. Uh, and he reviewed the following highlights of that symposium. And as you recall, this was Madame Capre, who we had run that uh, Symposium. This was nearly 50 people, Jatin, wasn't it, in the yeah. in the room uh, from all aspects of India, and and so Dr. Shaha reviewed a number of interesting uh, things. He they, they they discussed in this symposium the the um, the endemic goiter issue that related to uh, the typical surgical endeavor in in India, the the workup which is and management of of goiter which is increasingly oriented towards cost considerations. They discussed the existent still preference for total thyroidectomy in most cases of thyroid cancer. So differences in surgical management, as you've heard in other components of the Congress as to what is occurring in India. That in, in RAI use, the tendency is dosimetry rather than set dose, which is also a, a difference with other guidelines in other areas of the world. And that ATA guidelines are still used as one of the major information resources for management of thyroid cancer in India, and that, uh, that there was an increasing focus on the need to get greater acuity to the postgraduate endocrine surgical training. And actually, in this Indian symposium held on the pre-Congress day of the World Congress, there was the initial discussions of the formation of a new society of thyroid surgeons in India. So the the World Congress has been a, 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 a seed crystal for new surgical activity and organizational activity in India, which I'm, I'm proud to have. Um, I'm going to skip mine, and I'll, I'll go ahead and have uh, Dr. MacGyver give his. Can you, we call up Dr. MacGyver's slides? So Brian will discuss his uh, insights into thyroid cancer, changes, new challenges uh, at, uh, through the lens of the World Congress. Thank you. I'll just sit here. Oh, sure. yeah. You can advance my slides for me. Okay, sure. That'd be great. I only have uh, two slides, I think, um, and they really just recapitulate what you, Dr. Randolph just showed you. We had um, both panels and meet the professor sessions that I was asked to address, and I thought it was interesting just to list the panels that we had, uh, addressing thyroid nodules, low-risk thyroid cancer, lymph node metastases, a panel led elegantly by uh, Dr. LSI on medullary carcinoma, discussions around radioactive iodine, management of invasive disease in the visceral neck, poorly differentiated and anaplastic, and systemic therapy. And this is really a very comprehensive uh, view of thyroid cancer, sorry, of thyroid neoplasia from diagnosis to ultimate outcome. Um, I, to me, the panels are the central part of the Congress. It's what makes our Congress unique. These are case-based discussions. They are practical discussions of how we manage patients day by day. But they tapped into a breadth and depth of experience of our panelists, the likes of which uh, continues to impress me. And every one of these panels that I was able to attend uh, had tremendous lessons for me um, and uh, that will be applicable tomorrow in my practice as I go back to Tampa, Florida. On the thyroid nodule front, I think we had a really n nice opening session on thyroid nodules, and we spent a lot of time discussing the integration of pieces of information rather than sequential evaluation with the clinical evaluation, the ultrasound, the cytopathology, the use of molecular marker technologies uh, to the ultimate outcome. And I think this concept that we can no longer throw the baby away with the bathwater, that the uh, clinical appearance should continue to influence our assessment of thyroid nodules even when we know what the ultrasound looks like, that the ultrasound influences our interpretation of the cytopathology, that the cytopathology and the ultrasound influence our understanding of any molecular marker technology and the utility of that technology, and ultimately our management is the integration of all of those things together. And I think to me that's a, a new way uh, to think about the evaluation of thyroid nodules. 
Low-risk thyroid cancer, of course, was very elegantly discussed in the panel led by Dr. Shah. Uh, we have known for a long time that Dr. Shah has been a minimalist in surgical terms. That minimalist approach has, I think, regained uh, substantial um, momentum. And now, as we discussed earlier today, the move towards minimal surgery with lobectomy, even for two, three, or four centimeter papillary cancers, recognizes that low risk entity. And again, I think that we have uh, had a pendulum swing a long way away from the old days of total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine for everybody. And this panel certainly highlighted that. Dr. Randolph discussing lymph node metastatic disease and how that should be managed, typically surgically, of course, but uh, also by other modalities. This remains one of our biggest challenges because we as endocrinologists obsessively follow our patients and find detectable thyroglobulin and a positive microscopic lymph node and have to manage the recurrence of that disease. And so our preference is to eliminate the disease beforehand. The only alternative would be for us to stop being so obsessive about finding these little lymph nodes. Medullary cancer remains a conundrum for us. It's different from other cancers. It behaves differently. In fact, it's been said recently, I think accurately, medullary cancer is not a thyroid cancer. Medullary cancer is a neuroendocrine tumor that just happens to arise in a thyroid gland. And we need to have a very different mindset as we approach the management of medullary cancer compared to the mindset around follicular cell-derived thyroid cancer. And I think this was very much emphasized in Dr. Ellis's panel. Dr. Tuttle read, led the discussions about radioactive iodine. Um, Mike isn't here. Oh, good. I can attack him. Um, <laughs> Mike has gone through a dramatic transformation in his use of radioactive iodine from over the last 10, 15 years, as many of us have, away from the almost routine use in virtually every patient with a nodule of cancer more than a centimeter, now to the point where uh, Dr. Um, uh, Tuttle will argue against the use of radioactive iodine, even in patients with extra nodal extension or lymph node involvement or extra thyroidal extension. And again, this panel really began to explore the new spectrum of the use of radioactive iodine. On to invasive thyroid cancer, it remains a problem. Reconstructive surgery is often necessary. How to scrape away tumor versus opening up windows into the trachea. Um, a fascinating discussion around the management of that invasive disease, which then became even more fascinating as we transitioned to the poorly differentiated and the anaplastic thyroid cancers. These diseases are often systemic at the time of diagnosis, and we need to start thinking more like medical oncologists as we approach these patients. We need to start thinking about systemic therapies and introducing them earlier. Management with radiation therapy in cases of locally advanced disease, but systemic therapy, not just with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, but increasingly with targeted therapies and with um, perhaps even immunotherapy in the future. And if we're going to make advances in our knowledge there, we as an organization and we as uh, representatives of other organizations need to push one concept above everything else. And that is that patients who see us for advanced and progressive disease deserve to be offered care in the context of a clinical trial. And I think this is a dramatic change in our perspective, at least as endocrinologists and surgeons. We're not used to thinking about clinical trials for patients with thyroid cancer. We need them. And these uh, uh, panels were very influential in really pushing forward that idea that every patient we see who isn't cured with initial surgery deserves access to a clinical trial. Next slide, please. I will not walk through all of the MTPs. There were 18 of them or 19 of them. I've lost count, but there were a lot of uh, meet the professors. And again, these were areas where we could really drill down onto the details. And the uh, number of these that I was able to attend, at least a part of, were deep, intensive discussions with enthusiastic audience participation. And I certainly hope and believe that you, as participants, gained a lot of knowledge and insight from these sessions as well. We're certainly going to appreciate your feedback on these. There will be an opportunity to provide detailed feedback to us. And as we start thinking about Congress 3.5 and 4.0, please help us to design that so that we get the maximum benefit out of these kind of meetings. Um, uh, and I will stop at that point, except just to say thank you to the audience for your engagement and your participation. I really appreciate it. Dr. Jeremy Freeman, I apologize. There were some issues with my PowerPoint slide in terms of your image, and I very much apologize for that. Uh, but uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and give us your perspectives, please? Apology accepted. <laughs> Those are my pumping iron days. <laughs> um, so 
what I wanted to do is just give an overview uh, rather than a, uh, a targeted view that um, Brian just gave. Uh, I thought one of the um, keys to this whole meeting and an overview sort of perspective is the de-escalation of management. The pendulum has swung towards doing lesser, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, I've got a whole list of where lesser treatment is probably preferable. And the two issues with respect to the overall management of thyroid cancer is we're always striving for binary uh, decisions in the management of thyroid malignancy. In other words, rather than rely on subjective eyes of pathologists or risk factors, which may be quite nebulous, what we need is a number or a parameter or a metric on which to make a binary decision to say, yes, we're going to do this, or no, we're not going to do this. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it is now clear that the pathway to the management of, uh, of thyroid cancer is molecular biology. And Yuri Nikiforov, Jim Fagan have, uh, have led the charge in this arena, and uh, it's going to be the way of the future. And I can see in the next decade or so that rather than rely on fine needle aspirate uh, results, which are, which are quite uh, subjective that we'll be relying on a molecular test that says yes you have thyroid cancer and this is the operation you ought to do. Uh, it is clear that we now live in a molecular testing world. Uh, more and more, uh, the, the number of molecular testing sessions in the first two iterations of this Congress were very sparse. Almost everybody now is buzzing about molecular testing, and I believe this is going to be the, the, the way of the future, not only in, in um, diagnostics, but in therapeutics. Jim Fagan has elegantly shown that you can, um, we have a mapping now of the uh, kind of a Vogelsteinian model of the evolution of thyroid cancer, and now we can target treatments to interrupt that pathway. That pathway. And within the last couple of years, the issue of NIFP has reared its head, and uh, I'm not sure what we know. What, I'm not sure what we can do with this thing. I mean, you know, it's it's a diagnosis post facto, uh, and again, Yuri is probably working very assiduously as in in uh, developing new technology to give us a diagnosis uh, pre facto. Uh, is this a tumor? That's the other issue. Uh, is, this, is this cancer or is it not cancer? Yuri tells me that it's kind of in the middle. It's kind of like carcinoma in situ if you look at squamous carcinoma. So I'm not sure we can discount this and sort of uh, uh, um, throw patients out the door once that diagnosis is made. Uh, we just don't know if this evolves or has the potential to evolve into a cancer. And uh, surely if we are able to make a diagnosis of NIFP beforehand, we, can, we possibly can adopt the ETO uh, paradigm where we watch these patients rather than operating. So we're going to eliminate a whole uh, cadre of patients out of our surgical uh, armamentarium to, to, to just watch instead of operating. We're kind of like a, a self-destructing industry. We're looking for ways to, <laughs> to, to uh, destroy our, our patient load of surgery rather than uh, increase it like other industries do. Um, clearly, there's an evolution of systemic therapy, and uh, clearly this may be the way of the future. Rather than treating patients surgically, again, we might want to put ourselves out of business and give this patient uh, who has thyroid cancer a magic bullet pill that will get rid of this cancer. Um, nonetheless, in the management of uh, advanced thyroid cancer, metastatic disease, and palliation, uh, systemic, treat systemic treatment has, has uh, made boundless um, advances, and we look forward to further advances in the next meeting. And the other thing is the appropriate use of aggressive surgery for advanced disease. Uh, there have been several sessions promulgating this, um, this, this approach, and clearly in my practice, after having looked after uh, a large number of these advanced diseases. We can't give up on these patients. These patients may live for decades with advanced and aggressive uh, surgical treatment. And just one more slide, if you don't mind. 
And this is a slide I used in my, in my talk. Uh, there have been several advances with respect to our self-governance and our guideline approach to the management of thyroid cancer. And uh, certainly there have been efforts now to de-escalate the number of fine needle aspirates that we've, we've uh, performed. Number one is the pervasive use of inappropriate ultrasound, and I don't see any diminution in that, uh, in that arena, but uh, patient education and, and, and certainly physician education, and, and primarily the primary physicians need to be educated on which patients to send for ultrasound and which not. Um, there's been more expensive, extensive, expensive too, but extensive surgery in the past, um, and, and we've de-escalated this now that we're doing less and less of a procedure on these tumors that really don't need aggressive treatment. Uh, we've, we've, I think, uh, developed some methodology in, in diminishing the liberal use of prophylactic central neck dissection, which probably is not necessary. Um, there, have, there has been an extensive um, uh, literature and discussion, especially at this meeting, on the uh, diminution of the application of RAI. Uh, we've come a long way from the knee-jerk uh, response uh, a la Ernie Mazaferi that every patient needs RAI now to selected approaches to RAI, and not only that, we're developing now binary approaches to the application of RAIs, especially TG-targeted, uh, I'm sorry, TG-driven uh, decision-making in the application of RAI. Uh, we've had aggressive uh, approaches in the past to central compartments uh, surgically, and nowadays we're, we're thinking uh, more rationally about observing these patients or injecting them with alcohol rather than subjecting, subjecting them to, um, to uh, aggressive central compartment and lateral compartment procedures. And I, it, it harkens back to a conversation I once had with Ron Spiro, uh, who was a surgeon at Memorial, uh, talking about all our fancy methodologies to detect per, uh, um, uh, um, thyroid cancers that have recurred in the central neck and all these fancy operations that we've decided to do uh, to help these patients or think we help these patients. And Ron was saying, you know, what I do is I, uh, I follow up my thyroid cancer patients and all I do is I feel their neck. <laughs> and guess what? My results are just as good as all you guys who do all these fancy procedures. So I think there's something in what Ron said. And I think we're, we're operating too aggressively and managing too aggressively these patients who probably don't need any treatment whatsoever. And um, I'm not sure about the issue of too many surgeons uh, doing these cases, but certainly uh, in our province there's been oversight uh, on, on in many uh, surgical sites uh, to eliminate surgeons who are doing, for example, one Whipple operation a year. Those hospitals don't get funded for those procedures. So um, that's one way to eliminate uh, uh, surgeons doing three or four cases a year uh, that ought, probably ought not to be doing them. So that brings to a conclusion, Dr. Randolph, my oversight on this uh, wonderful, wonderful meeting. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Freeman. <laughs> Dr. Shaw, can we have your comments? Can you bring up Dr. Shaw's slides? Thanks. Uh, Greg asked me to particularly uh, oversee and summarize surgical aspects of presentations at this meeting. And I came away with uh, some notes on what I observed on the sessions that I attended. Can I have the next slide, please? So uh, I think I'm, I divided this into two categories, low-risk papillary carcinoma, the great majority of thyroid cancer patients. And there seems to be now through various panels, keynotes, and paper presentations, a consensus on low-risk unifocal tumors uh, well served by lobectomy alone, and so much so that the ATA guidelines now accepts and even recommends that lobectomy is sufficient treatment for intrathyroidal low-risk papillary carcinomas. And mind you, I'm uh, every word that I'm using is important. So don't extrapolate uh, by twisting the language. 
Low risk implies younger patients with well differentiated tumors which are intrathyroidal. We are still squabbling on the size of the tumor, should be one centimeter, 1.5 centimeter, two centimeters, what have you. There is plenty of data that exists in the literature and presented here that as long as the tumor is unifocal and intrathyroidal, I don't think size makes any difference. And lobectomy will well serve your patient, reduce the morbidity of excessive treatment as Jeremy pointed out. And uh, I think this was brought up in one of the discussions that uh, patients who have a lobectomy have their endogenous thyrotropin serving them rather than uh, totally relying on synthetic uh, 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 L-thyroxine. These, some of these patients just don't feel well. Uh, they're biochemically, they are fine, but they come and complain to you, doctor, I'm not the same person I used to be. And there is something to be said about endogenous thyrotropin versus synthetic L-thyroxine. So uh, he, uh, there is one more area in support of a lobectomy. We heard from Jeremy, and I think by design, some of this stuff will be repeated by multiple people, because these are common observations. The, uh, we went through a swing of elective node dissection, relying on the harvest of occult metastasis as an index of success of the operation, fully realizing that we were adding morbidity uh, to the patient, functional anesthetic, without any oncologic benefit of the operation. So the pendulum has swung back, the, and there is again ample data shown at this meeting and in the literature that there is no benefit to elective central compartment or lateral neck dissection in differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Uh, Jeremy pointed out that if you have done a total thyroidectomy, there is now a recommendation of only selective use of radioactive iodine and not in every patient. So total thyroidectomy is not an indication for radioactive iodine treatment. And even ATA guidelines tell you to be selectively choosing patients. And as was pointed out, unless the patient's tumor falls into the high-risk category or there is persistently elevated thyroglobulin, uh, there has been significant breaks on the uh, willingly use of radioiodine post-surgery. Uh, genomic testing uh, is again recommended in selected patients. In patients where you have already made the decision to operate, Genomic testing does not add value to your judgment or the conduct of the operation. It will add expense, but does not uh, change the course of events in the operating room. The panel uh, ran by uh, Greg on lymph node metastasis uh, extensively discussed the risk and benefit of neck dissections, whether it is central or lateral. And the panel discussion highlighted the importance of a comprehensive compartmental node dissection rather than limited node plucking or limited clearance of lymph nodes. And the panel did end up uh, summarizing that central compartment lymph node dissection includes lymph nodes from the hyoid to the innominate and from carotid to carotid, which implies level six and seven and not just one paratracheal ipsilateral dissection. If you are going to label the operation as central compartment node dissection, it implies higher to innominate and carotid to carotid clearance of lymph nodes. Or else specify in your operating note that I cleared only ipsilateral paratracheal lymph nodes. And similarly, if you have done a lateral neck dissection, it should comprehensively cover and, and remove lymph nodes at levels two, three, four, and five. Can I have the next slide, please? We also discuss this a lot, that do all low-risk thyroid cancers need to be treated? And uh, in addition to the data from Japan, from the Kuma Hospital, Professor Miyauchi and uh, Professor Ito, uh, there is a randomized, uh, the, randomized, I take it back, there is a prospective trial at Memorial Hospital now of over 300 patients being followed for over uh, with a median of seven years, 
essentially duplicating the observations of the Japanese data uh, that about 15% of patients under surveillance will eventually go on to have surgery. So there is room for uh, not treating and observing patients or keeping them under active surveillance. Next slide, please. We heard a masterful treatise on Theodore Coker. Non-surgeons may not appreciate the importance of uh, Theodore Emil Coker, who has been a legend in the history of surgery, not just thyroid surgery. On thyroid surgery, he was the Nobel, first Nobel laureate surgeon, but he has impacted upon surgery in general, and uh, what a masterful presentation it was from uh, on the keynote address. Uh, next slide. For advanced thyroid cancer, uh, on the panel conducted by Mark Erkin, uh, we uh, were brought, told about the importance of achieving a R0 resection whenever feasible and possible. And that was emphasized that leaving gross disease behind does not serve the patient. So, uh, and uh, various complex resections and reconstructions were demonstrated very masterfully. So, uh, cer certainly the surgeons would have enjoyed that panel. And finally, in the video panels, uh, three sessions, uh, various surgical procedures uh, and techniques were demonstrated uh, by expert surgeons as to the uh, details of the and the finesse of surgery, the comprehensiveness of the operations, and the pitfalls of doing or not doing things in, uh, in the uh, conduct of the operative procedure. I believe this is my last slide. Is that correct? Or is that one more? Yeah, keep the last one, please. So finally, this is what I came away with uh, as a as single statement, if you want to take home as a take home message, that there is a need to develop a multidisciplinary thyroid cancer management team with a uniform philosophy between the surgeon, the endocrinologist, as well as nuclear medicine physicians. Because at the end of the day, the patient should hear the same opinion and not different opinions from three different specialists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Witterick? Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. I really appreciate being on the steering committee and uh, value my colleagues so much. And it's a real testament to this uh, organization to see so many people in the last few hours, because usually it dwindles uh, quite a bit. Uh, many of you attended the pre-meeting congresses, and we had several ultrasound courses and uh, uh, different congresses and a primer course, and lots of education was going on there. And I want to shout out to Dr. Russ Smith, who did an absolutely fabulous job in organizing the, uh, 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 there's an advanced course and a basic course, and those were really well attended. I'm going to take a little bit of a lighter note on this because I know my colleagues are much more serious than I am and much more uh, scholarly. So can you imagine, uh, Greg Randolph, that you have your daughter there as a volunteer, healthy, normal volunteer, and you have Maisie Shindo and Susan Mandel examining her thyroid. And you're thinking to yourself, what if they find a nodule? What <laughs> if it is, oh, is there no that? And so uh, Greg breathed a sigh of relief when there was no nodules and her vocal cords had perfectly normal movement. Now, we also had a lot of uh, fine needle aspiration practice with FNAs and we had experts there uh, teaching. But if you look there, uh, there's these phantoms. Now, a normal phantom costs about three to $400 to buy. But Russ Smith can't come up with this great thing where you take a pound of gelatin, I should write this down, pound of gelatin powder, a gallon of warm water and some dye, food coloring dye. That makes a blob that you, uh, <laughs> there, and then you put it into a plastic container with some olives and onions and uh, mix it all together and voila, you have your phantom. It was absolutely beautiful, cost $20 for, for the whole thing, so we saved a lot of money uh, with that. It was amazing how well attended uh, the various congresses were when you went around and you looked. Uh, there was just such great knowledge and education going on. Uh, uh, Dr. Shaw has already mentioned this fabulous uh, lecture by Dr. Peter Kopp on, now, how many people can put in that, you know, 
that, uh, uh, yeah, you know, that, he, uh, that he had in there with Cole Kerr. I, I, I just can't quite do it. And then the amazing thing is all the surgeons and even non-surgeons came up to look at these shiny new uh, instruments. Not so new. They were Coker's original uh, instruments. And so there was a sort of a swarm up at the end there. And I must admit that I, I couldn't resist uh, you know, getting my picture taken with that one. But then we actually look who took it. My, my friend to the side of me, the, the most famous head and neck surgeon on the plant that was taking a picture of me holding Coker's instruments. So I thought that was uh, very, very special. I don't know how many of you had the chance to go around and, and visit some of the e-posters, but there was really good science going on there, a lot of great engagement. I commend the people who were there and were listening. It, it was really fabulous, and I think the, the e-posters worked really well for this Congress, and congratulations. And I, I really want to congratulate the oral uh, presentations as well, because if you had a chance to go to some of those, there were some really, really high quality randomized clinical trials, prospective clinical trials, and things that you're going to see published, and they were presented here first, and, and I really commend the authors for those oral presentations. And then last night, we had a fabulous gala dinner. Uh, we had a birthday for Dr. Lavolsi, which was we sang happy birthday, and then Dr. Kim gave us a rendition of Danny Boy and other arias, which was really fabulous. Now, in a more serious note, I came here and I wanted to learn more about molecular testing because I live in the Canadian healthcare system, which is a publicly funded system, and we cannot currently afford this within our system. And so when we do this, we have patients pay for it, and it's quite expensive. And so I came here trying to figure out what is the best option. And I attended at least four different lectures or uh, different series and sessions on that. And I came away with RNA, genes, DNA, chips, sequencing. I don't understand it. So uh, later this afternoon, Dr. McIver is going to give me an idiot's guide to <laughs> genetic <laughs> tests. So if anybody wants to come to that, I said five minutes and just give me the basic facts. So he's going to do that, which is great. Another thing that I, I still question is because we have these ATA guidelines and they seem, you know, very complete, but when you actually get uh, panelists in a room and you give them a 3.7 centimeter papillary cancer in the right lobe, what was interesting to me, and, and this was across several sessions that I attended, the size was a little bit different. Some people were doing a hemi, some people were doing a total, some people were doing a total with a unilateral uh, central neck dissection, and some people were doing a total uh, with a bilateral central neck dissection. And then some of the people got iodine, some people didn't get iodine. And uh, what was really interesting is one session I was at where they did total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection, and then they had a nine millimeter node that came back later on, and they just watched it even though there was nothing in the central neck and, and, and uh, later on. So there's still a lot of things that we uh, uh, don't understand and we don't know the exact algorithm and we have a lot of differences of opinion uh, with that. So it makes it a very lively and interesting conversation. And then so uh, many people now are observing these. And what was interesting was yesterday when I went to uh, a lecture on sort of non-operative treatment, uh, I had heard uh, about Dr. Ian Hayes' famous um, uh, lectures and how he could get up, and so he gave a spontaneous lecture in the middle of a presentation about alcohol ablation, which was most interesting, and he made the point that um, instead of just observing uh, many of these uh, so-called micrometastases, that at the Mayo Clinic they're injecting them with alcohol with great results, and I found that interesting. It was also fascinating, similar to the last World Congress, there's a lot of work in Italy and Asia on using laser ablation and radiofrequency ablation, not only of uh, benign nodules, but of malignant nodules, and, and the literature on that is growing, and it's really a fascinating uh, subject uh, with that. So on behalf of uh, our, uh, my committee and colleagues who did all of the, the work, thank you for including me, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ian. And uh, now, Dr. Brian Haugen, can we have uh, you give us uh, your thoughts regarding the World Congress and thyroid cancer in general? Yes, thank you very much, Greg, and thanks to uh, really a number of people, but Greg and Brian, for really your leadership um, in this uh, amazing conference. And I think my first slide that I have is, this is sort of how I felt. 
Um, and I don't know how many of you felt this way, like this young child trying to drink from a fire hose. Um, I got very wet and I took in a little, I took in some information. I'd like to I synthesize a little bit of that and the excitement that I took away from this. Uh, as you've heard from our two previous panel members, I think uh, one of the highlights for me was really listening to Peter Kopp's just amazing uh, lecture on Professor Theodore Coker. I also wanted to have a picture of Professor Kopp, Professor um, a cop and Professor Hocher together. I don't know how I said that, Peter, but um, in the same slide. Uh, I think what I took away from this was not only all the things he said, but when you really looked at Professor Hocher's life as a clinician, caring for patients and being a meticulous clinician, being a thoughtful scientist, and really being a compassionate humanist. And I think if no matter what our agreements or disagreements are, what I took away from this is if we can each approach it that same way, I think we can do best for our patients and for society as long as we focus on those three things. So again, thank you, Peter, for that wonderful talk. Also, I was fortunate enough to, to uh, oversee this um, session, and we talk about guidelines. And there was a nice one about guidelines around the world. And we presented three cases, and you've heard about some of this throughout of a person with a 2.7 centimeter papillary carcinoma, nothing else. And if you look across the various guidelines, there really are much more in common than are different, which I thought was, was quite good in that now we're moving to this lobectomy or thyroidectomy can be considered across various guidelines, not just the ATA guidelines. And also the use, as we've heard, about radioiodine and using it more selectively and this is being enforced across multiple guidelines. And I think this World Congress has really helped us pull people from around the world to have this discussion. And then finally, in this session, there was a discussion about when to use multikinase inhibitor therapy. Um, and again, I think it was a number of years ago, and we started this as well, somebody has metastatic disease, let's use it. Now we're being more circumspect. And, and uh, again, Lori Worth at one of the talks had this really wonderful mathematical pendulum uh, 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 slide. Uh, and um, really, the pendulum maybe has now swung a little farther to not using it when it's appropriate. And we're working to try to find the right time. But again, the guidelines are developing. And I was just impressed with the similarities rather than the differences across the world in approaches to these patients. Mm. Some of the clinical things, as you heard this morning, which I was quite excited about, was hearing about Bethesda too. I'm also happy to hear that it's not going to just totally rock our world. Um, and uh, it, it really is uh, similar, but uh, Dr. Sebus really did a great job of, of talking about that's coming. Obviously, we heard more about NIFT-P and how we're going to try to incorporate that. And so quit asking if it's benign or if it's malignant. <laughs> it's NIFT-P. Um, and then, then the eighth edition of the AJCC TNM is coming out and is going to be implemented in January. So I think we need to get more and more familiar with that. And that really helped me here listening to some of the experts talk about that and how we're going to apply it. And what was nice from a, um, a survival standpoint is many patients are being moved into stage one. And the survival rate is still very high. So I, I think, again, we're maybe going to be doing some advances for our patients there. Um, and Dr. Louise Davies, uh, attribution bias. I really hadn't heard that much about that before. But as you find more reservoir of disease and this idea of a slight increase in the death rate, is that real or is that this attribution bias? And I think we need to, to look more at that. Obviously, being a molecular biologist, and I do a lot of work in the lab, I, I was very interested, um, as Ian was in the molecular markers, and um, what I guess I would call it is the next generation. We think we're getting to understand ThyroSeq version 2. Now there's a ThyroSeq version 3 that we just heard about. Um, and also applying these to prognosis, not just simply saying, is this going to be a histopathologic diagnosis, but how is this going to potentially behave biologically? We know about the Affirma GEC, now there's an Affirma GSC that really has improved the specificity uh, of this test as well. And then there's other markers such as the Rosetta Reveal that can be used actually on existing specimens. You don't have to get a fresh specimen. So I think this is evolving for us and we need to see how do we incorporate these into our practice. And again, I think the real next generation is going to be prognosis. 
In the basic translational research, some things that fascinated me there, uh, there was really a very nice talk on using some new technology to find the parathyroid. I know I'm not a surgeon and supposed to talk about surgery, but I thought that was fascinating that you could use a technology of autofluorescence to identify and avoid damaging the parathyroid at surgery. I think there are some newer models that we're finding um, in this thought of fusion uh, was really quite interesting because of its role with the IGF-1 receptor and potentially saying these patients who have advanced disease may benefit from a directed therapy here. Also, vitamin D is coming back into our discussion and, and maybe vitamin D metabolism could play a role in thyroid cancer um, progression and, and maybe therapeutic options as well. And then some new mouse models, such as the ALK fusion model by the Nikki Foroff group, a nice poorly differentiated thyroid cancer model I found was quite interesting. And so finally, I think obviously we're always left with questions. Um, and I think in discussions I've heard, I think we need to have more discussion around the definition of radioiodine refractory disease with our nuclear medicine colleagues and better define that. Active surveillance in low-risk differentiated thyroid cancer. You heard about that, and I think that's going to be evolving. And how do we do it, and how do we appropriately study it? Obviously, the lobectomy versus thyroidectomy, and I think one thing that, that I took away from this was going back to the patient as well, patient satisfaction and anxiety. And I think when we study this, we need to bring that in as well, not just recurrence and things like that, but how are the patients dealing with this and how can we better educate them, which also we're gonna be working more with these decision sharing um, and also decision making tools that many people around here and around the world are developing. And I think that's gotta be folded into our studies with these as well. So again, I think this was an amazing conference and like any good conference, probably many more questions came out than answers, but it really was very collegial and uh, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Brian. Ezra, can I can we get your comments? Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Greg. Let me let me first start by saying um, uh, that I am uh, truly humbled uh, first to be a part of uh, the steering committee uh, with um, really the world leaders in this disease, uh, and second by the response uh, from the attendees not only in coming here and truly making this a world congress in lung cancer, the representation from attendees all over the world is, is incredible, uh, but also your participation in the panels, in the meet the professors, the questions, the discussion, uh, the, the ones that I was involved in, really incredible and at, a, and at a very high level. So um, uh, truly, truly humbled by being a part of this. Um, Greg, I did not follow your instructions, so uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, what I decided to do, and maybe I did a little bit, was really take a medical oncologist perspective and try to highlight, I think, a couple of things to look forward to uh, for perhaps uh, the next iteration of this in 2021 and what is going to happen um, for the systemic therapy of treatment of the advanced uh, thyroid cancer patients. Um, in the next uh, four years. Uh, the other thing I learned was uh, through the video sessions, I think I can do a total thyroidectomy now, guys. I'm pretty sure I know how to do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try that maybe tomorrow. Um, so, uh, so let me uh, borrow a slide from Lori Wurst's talk, excellent uh, um, uh, uh, plenary or keynote uh, talk. And she really summarized what many of us as medical oncologists and, and uh, endocrinologists are beginning to realize that there are a lot of targets in advanced thyroid cancer patients, uh, be it uh, anaplastic, poorly differentiated, papillary follicular, and of course, uh, medullary thyroid cancer that we can take advantage of. And although um, the sequencing may not be universally available, um, what we will see over the next coming years is more and more patients uh, will have access to this, uh, certainly um, in many countries that we come from, and we will find these uh, targets because they are actionable and there are more and more drugs 
drugs being developed and available for these patients that have refractory and advanced disease. And one example um, is a patient that I presented during one of the sessions, an anaplastic thyroid cancer patient with an NTRAC3 fusion um, that is found in, uh, although rare, but is found in um, uh, a few cancers uh, that we see. And you can see uh, from the far left uh, that the patient was refractory to lenvatinib, a commonly used TKI in these patients, um, and uh, started on a drug called entrectinib, N uh, NTRAC3 inhibitor, and uh, lo and behold, one month later, a dramatic response uh, to this single agent in a patient who really was going to die of their disease. So look, look forward to more sequencing, more targets, and more drugs in use in patients with thyroid cancer. And then I, I really um, would be remiss not to mention immunotherapy. Uh, for those of you who aren't oncologists in the room, and I suspect it's the majority, immunotherapy has taken oncology by storm. Um, you basically can't go to a meet an oncology meeting anymore without hearing that word, and uh, rightly so, because it really is changing the standard of care for many cancers that we see, and I believe it will change the standard of care for patients with advanced thyroid cancer before we have our next meeting in uh, 2021. Uh, the video, by the way, is of a, if you haven't uh, realized, is a T cell uh, shown in red attacking a uh, tumor cell. And what we will see, I believe, is further study of immune modulators in this disease. I apologize. I realize the, the font is too small, um, but I'll read it to you. Um, especially and first in the form of anti-PD-1, PD-L1. But then we're realizing through multiple translational studies and laboratories around the world that uh, the tumor microenvironment in thyroid cancers are incredible, is incredibly immunosuppressive, especially around the M2. To, uh, macrophage, and there are now ways to target that, and we will see those studies in advanced thyroid cancer. In addition, thyroid cancer uh, is a wonderful model to study personalized immunotherapy. Um, that is neoantigen-directed uh, treatments based on the mutations that are found. Uh, uh, we're already working with neoantigen tumor-infiltrating lymphocytes in, in several diseases, including thyroid cancer, and believe it or not, personalized vaccines. And lastly, cell therapy will begin to make inroads into thyroid cancer in the form of um, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. There are already trials being planned uh, and that will likely be open before the end of this calendar year using CARs in uh, uh, thyroid cancers. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, 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 both in the form of T cells and NK cells. In addition to that, of course, further engineering of TCRs in thyroid cancer. And, oh, and that is my last slide. So I think we're going to see uh, quite uh, a few changes uh, in the next four years that we'll be able to talk about in reality uh, in 2021. Thanks, Greg. Great. Very good. Thank you, Ezra. So uh, I'm going to present uh, very briefly with just two slides some of my own perspectives, and the first one just relates to the World Congress as an educator and educational uh, tool. Um, what I perceived as the two real strengths and opportunities that this World Congress gives us. You know, together there is strength here. And this Congress first and foremost taught me the strength of global collaboration. This is an incredible opportunity we have, all being in the same room together. Realize this. It's a responsibility we have to our patients to orchestrate our activities. Just because we come from different countries and we come from different specialties, it is our responsibility to our patients to optimize our coordination of activities. Look at this room. Look at the knowledge that this represents. This is an opportunity we have to optimize this. We have to all work together. And also, the multidisciplinary nature of this, you've heard it over and over again, even in the purest surgical panels, the importance of nuclear medicine, imaging to determine where we go, pathology, the rudder of what are we in fact doing and removing, benign, malignant, 
pre-malignant, NIFT-P. So the, the coordination of medical activities, uh, medical oncology, radiation oncology, this is a team sport. And I think that's a, another real main pillar, foundation of the World Congress is this multidisciplinary nature. This is the nature of the beast we have here. Thyroid cancer treatment is a team sport. And so we really need to work together. So work with us, work with the steering committee to optimize what this World Congress presents us an opportunity to really move forward. The second thing I want to mention relates to Nepal, and I'll call this N the Nepal effect. And that is that I met a young woman, and I introduced myself, and she explained she was uh, one of the leading endocrinologists in Nepal. And I said, that's very great that you come and visit with us. What sessions were of greatest interest to you? And she told me that the radioactive iodine sessions were of great interest to her, discussing hypothyroid versus stimulated thyroid uh, um, uh, recombinant TSH uh, preparation, the, the subtleties of the dosing of ablative therapy, 30 and 50 millicuries, the controversies as to dosimetry versus standard dosing for treatment of metastatic disease. And I said, why were those things of such great interest? She said, because in Nepal, we do not have radioactive iodine. So we need to have a conversation. We need to have the World Congress be, we will have the World Congress be the format and the focus of that conversation. We need to talk about robotic therapy in some corners versus I can't get to a surgeon in many other areas of the world. We need to talk about fractionated IMRT and understand that in many places there is no radiation therapy at all. We need to talk about guidelines that discuss the subtleties of radioactive iodine dosing and different ways of stimulated thyroglobulin measures in the context of entire countries who do not have the ability to give radioactive iodine. We need to have a conversation here. I'm not saying we shouldn't have guidelines that emphasize the best practice. Of course, we endeavor towards perfect management of thyroid cancer. But we have feet of clay. We are here on this planet. We need to take into account the realities of what our patients experience and what resources exist and don't exist. We need to take off our blinders and make some real discussions here, some practical discussions that relate to what you have available and what you do not have available. So with that, I want to thank all of the, uh, uh, the steering committee and all of their uh, intuition, their insight, their instincts, which is really what this panel was intending to bring up relating to thyroid cancer and relating to this tool we have, the World Congress. So I want to thank all of the steering committee. And if you could now just uh, put up that video. Hi, I'm Greg Randolph. We're at the World Congress 3.0, and I'm here with uh, Gori. Uh, Gori, tell us, uh, where are you from, and what sort of physician are you? What sort of work do you do? So I'm from Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, India, mm -hmm. and um, I'm a head and neck surgeon. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we do, um, if you're talking about thyroid, um, we do a lot of thyroid cancers, mm -hmm. very high volume center. We do around um, 300 thyroidectomies per year. Really? So Tata Hospital is a very renowned, historically a renowned head and neck surgical hospital, isn't that right? Yes, that's right. That's huh. right. Hi, I'm Greg Randolph and I'm here with Estelle Chang. Estelle, tell us, uh, where, what, uh, what's, where do you work and uh, how was it that you came to the World Congress? So my name is Estelle Chang. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, I had a chance to hear about this um, meeting uh, when I was at the thyroid surgery course um, that was organized and given by Dr. Randolph uh, in November of last year. 
Um, and when I saw the content, the program of this conference, um, I immediately realized that it would be an excellent opportunity to learn everything there is to know about thyroid cancer. With that, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for sharing your time. I want to thank you for learning with us. I want to remind you of 3.5 and 4.0. Thank you and travel well. <laughs>